So welcome friends uh, uh, to this uh, a joint webinar, uh, Influence and New Challenges, which is being organized under the auspices of the MENA ISN Association, which is Middle East, uh, Eurasia, Africa, Influenza Stakeholders Network, along with uh, the Indian Chess Society. Uh, as we know that for the past nearly two years, we've been swamped by COVID and we hardly had any time to think of anything else. Uh, given the fact that we are in the midst of the uh, seasonality for influenza for the Northern Hemisphere, and India has uh, a circulation which does have a lot of pockets of circulation during the Northern Hemisphere uh, season. So we thought that this is an opportune to, time to have a joint webinar with the Association of Men and and ICS to talk about influenza, which has actually gone into uh, a backbench uh, for, for, these, uh, for these two years. We hardly had a circulation for uh, the Northern as well as the Southern Hemisphere for nearly two seasons. However, we are seeing it again. And I think uh, this is the most opportune time for discussing uh, influenza against the backdrop of the COVID. And for this, uh, uh, we, have a, we have an eminent panel of speakers. And uh, uh, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Salah Ravidi, who is the chairperson of the MENA ISN uh, Association. He is the ex-director of the Communicable Disease Surveillance and Control Ministry of Health, Oman. And he is a member of the Polio Transit Independent Monitoring Board and Polio. He is also a member of the European Union Diabetes and Influenza Group, member of the Global Task uh, Force Team of Pandemic Influenza Vaccine Response and Global Task Team of Influenza Disease Burden. So, so he wears many hats and he is also uh, an advisor to the uh, ministry uh, in his country on eradication, elimination and control of communicable diseases of public health importance. So he will give us a welcome address uh, to, the, to the symposium. Dr. Silla, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carl. Uh, uh, good afternoon and good evening for others. Let me just uh, again introduce myself. I think Dr. Cole had did a great job. My name is Salah Lawedi and my background is I'm a pediatrician and clinical epidemiologist, and I am chairperson of the MENA ISN. Well, uh, as Dr. Cole said, the MENA ISN stands for Middle East, Eurasia, and Africa Influenza Stakeholder Network. And this is an organization or association that uh, uh, had been registered in 2019 in the Republic of South Africa as a nonprofit public benefit voluntary association. Indeed, it is uh, a great joy and privilege to welcome you you all, colleague, friends, to our first collaboration webinar between us, Mina SN, and Indian Chess Society. This is really great event. I really appreciate for that. We are really again honored to have this type of collaboration, and we hope in in this webinar entitled "The Influenza Newer Challenges." And as you, you will see. Uh, as we're going through uh, a number of these imminent uh, speakers, we believe that the uh, MINASN and Indian Chess Society have the responsibility and moral obligation to continually enhance scientific excellence in the field of influenza in our regions and the countries. And to meet our objective, the webinar organizer of these two associations did it, it is best to prepare a number of innovative speakers and panelists to address some of the most recent information and influenza related issue uh, around it. And, and as part of our webinar program, we have evolved to more interactive enabling everybody to be very actively participate. So we are expecting your questions and queries to be posted and we will try our best to answer your questions. So uh, uh, by saying so, I would like to thank everybody and I highly appreciate 
the collaboration between the MINASN and Indian Chess Society and hope we'll have more to come. And without further delay, once again, thank you for all of you attending and wish you a wonderful and productive webinar. Uh, and Dr. Cole, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sadaravidi, and for that uh, welcome address. And uh, uh, we, uh, without further ado, I think we can go ahead with the uh, first talk uh, of the uh, evening. And it will be uh, delivered by uh, Padma Shri, uh, Dr. Randeep Kuderia, who basically needs no introduction to this audience. He is the director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and the first uh, DM in pulmonary and critical care in the country, has been conferred so many awards from Padma Shri to BC Roy Awards to multiple Lung India Awards, has delivered lots of uh, orations, and uh, has been the mouthpiece uh, of the policy of the government in terms of uh, in terms of the covid management and we see him every time on tv dictating policies talking about the science behind those po policies and advising the country actually for covid appropriate behaviors as his something that he has coined and it's become a, a routine buzzword. So uh, it's it's an honor to have him here. Uh, Dr. Randeep Guerrero is going to talk about uh, influenza epidemiology in India and what is the difference that India holds in compare, comparison to the globe. Uh, Dr. Randeep Guerrero, please. Thank you very much uh, for your kind words. Uh, uh, Dr. Call, let, let me just share my screen. Are you going to share, Professor? Or yes, I'm, screen, do I'm that. just trying to see. I ah, can, uh, okay. okay. Give me a few seconds or two. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah, it's sure. already there. No it's problem. The first slide there. is already displayed. So uh, let me really thank the Indian Chess Society and the uh, MENA ISN for inviting me and, of course, uh, Dr. Call and Dr. Rajadhar to give this talk. Uh, I'll be in the next... Uh, um, uh, 20, 18 to 20 minutes time quickly cover the epidemiology of influenza in India and why it is different. So I'll just start with the general aspect, then influenza epidemiology globally, and then of course, how India is different. So we all know that influenza is uh, belongs to the family of the ortho uh, mixoviruses. It's a single standard RNA virus, and we have type A, type B, and type C. Type A is the one that we are really concerned about because it causes a disease both in humans, animals, and birds and causes more severe disease. We also know that it's classified based on the two surface glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. Uh, the hemagglutinin attaches, uh, is uh, involved in attachment and entry, and the neuraminidase as far as release is concerned. Uh, we have uh, influenza A with 18H antigen subtypes and 11N antigen subtypes, causes seasonal outbreaks in major epidemics. Uh, influenza B causes seasonal outbreaks not usually associated with the, um, epidemics or pandemics, and influenza C usually is not that important. Now, as if you look at the influenza virus, it says it has it is a it has segmented genomes, it has genetic reassortment, and it also has what we call antigenic shift and antigenic drift. So the virus is a segmented uh, uh, influenza virus is segmented genome and has genetic reassortment, and like I said, uh, it's characterized by the enveloped glycoproteins, hemagglutinin, and neuraminidase. And depending on the degree, degree of change that happens in terms of mutation, we have what we call an antigenic shift where there is reassortment, uh, which uh, does not really uh, lead, uh, which leads to a novel virus, an antigenic drift, which leads to point mutation in the RNA gene segments. So you can have reassortment, that is, you can have a non-human virus which can directly jump into human species. The classical example is H5N1, which is known as bird flu or avian influenza, which is basically an avian virus which has jumped species. Or you can have mixing or a reassortment occurring in a reassortment vessel, usually a swine, where the human virus and a non-human virus could mix and you could have reassortment. And this is how we had the H1N1 pandemic of a reassorted virus 
which had uh, uh, human and avian and swine or, uh, sort of uh, segments in it. So based on this, you can have seasonal outbreaks and also they can be pandemics. If you look at the major pandemics that we've had in the last uh, 150 years, the one of great concern is the Spanish flu, which happened in 1918 and 1919. And we had a pandemic in 1997 and uh, 1957 and 1958, which was driven by the H2N2 variant. If you look at the data from India, as far as Spanish flu was concerned, it was associated with a huge degree of mortality. Uh, this time, at this point in time, India was part of British India. And mortality during this time was almost seven to eight, 10 million people. And at that point in, at point in time, our population was only 389 million. So it's important to keep this in mind that influenza does cause significant degree of morbidity and mortality. For any uh, virus to become cause a pandemic, and that is true for influenza, you need to have three basic things. It has to be a novel virus to which mankind is not exposed. So there is a total, uh, there is no immunity to it. It can have good human to human spread and also it can replicate in humans and cause disease. So this is what we've seen both in the H1N1 pandemic and we're seeing this now with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is an editorial that I had written uh, in uh, 2018 uh, when we looked at 100 years of the flu pandemic and we had said that after 100 years, India is still vulnerable and we need to actually prepare for a pandemic. We were talking more of flu at that point in time not realizing that we could have another, uh, another virus of the corona family, which would subsequently cause a pandemic. If you look at the global epidemiology of influenza, and this has been done for a large, many years since 1952, where we had a global influenza surveillance, which has been conducted by the WHO Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. And then subsequently the flu network, the flu net, which was a global uh, web-based tool for influenza virological surveillance, which was started in 1997, a large body of data has collected globally in terms of how the virus behaves, the pattern, and this has allowed uh, various uh, uh, policy uh, makers uh, to uh, policy makers to make various decisions. What we know is that in temperate countries, outbreaks of influenza occurs most exclusively during the winter months in the southern and northern northern hemisphere. However, influenza may occur throughout the in tropics and may be very variable for what we see in the northern and southern hemisphere. So if you look at influenza in the Northern Hemisphere, it actually tends to peak predominantly in the winter months. And this is what we've seen in 2019. And what you can see is that it peaks during the winter months and there's hardly any influenza during the summer months. It's almost non-existent. The same happens in the Southern Hemisphere where you can see that during their winter time, there is a peak uh, with very few cases see, being reported in the summer that we see in Australia or in South Africa. Uh, this uh, is a data which looked at uh, seasonality, timing, and uh, the climate drivers of influenza. Uh, this is from more than uh, 85 countries. And more than one influenza epidemics occur per year. This was more common in tropical countries than in temperate countries. And year-round activity was seen in temperate countries and also in tropical countries. And I think this is very important that uh, the tropical countries and the temperate uh, countries are slightly uh, different in terms of their uh, activity. If you look at the global influenza uh, virus circulation the past 12 months, and this is basically from 2020 to 2021, uh, as was mentioned that we've seen that uh, there was uh, um, subdued uh, influenza circulation during the height of the pandemic, possibly because of lockdown and other restrictions. But what we're seeing now is that there is a surge in influenza cases and this positivity is increasing. Uh, and this is something that we need to keep in mind. Coming to India, how is it different? Uh, India is, has a vast uh, latitudinal geographical expansion. We are tropical and to some extent even subtropical in the Northern part of our country. And uh, hence uh, India falls in the tropical region between the equator and the Tropic of Cancer. And, this subtropical region also. And that is why we behave in a very different manner as compared to uh, countries like Europe, uh, like the US or the UK or Australia and Africa, or South Africa. This is an old slide, but this is just to highlight that even when we looked at a data way back in uh, 2005 to 2008, we did find that there was seasonality and influenza was present significantly if you look for it. The reason I'm putting this uh, up is because at that point in time, in the late 90s and early 2000s, when one talked about influenza, 
many clinicians were very skeptical and said influenza occurs only in the colder climates and doesn't occur in tropical countries. There also then, but when looked at the data, one was able to see that there was uh, two spikes that we were seeing in Delhi. One, of course, during the winter months, and then again, during uh, the monsoon months from al almost July to September. This was seen uh, in uh, over multiple uh, years that we had a look at, that you could see these peaks happening at that point in time. From NIV Pune also, there was some degree of variation, but a similar type of data emerged, which was very different from what was being reported in the Western world in terms of the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, again, uh, what is basically coming out, and this is more recent data from 2018 to 2021, that India being a tropical and a subtropical country has more than one seasonal peak of fluenza per year. And as you can see, there is a monsoon peak followed by a winter peak and then another monsoon peak. And then of course the winter peak. This is the time when there was really no influenza because of the COVID pandemic. And like I said, now again, we're seeing that there is a surge in the number of cases during uh, last year, uh, when we did see a significant number of influenza cases uh, in terms of the monsoon months. Also, if you look at WHO Southeast uh, Asia region, which includes India, clearly shows that India had two seasonal peak, winter and monsoon season, although the percentage positivity uh, was lower uh, during the COVID pandemic, but the monsoon peak is still appreciable. And this is basically the blue line and the red line, of course, is related to COVID. So you see this huge surge of COVID, but subsequently you see that during the monsoon months, again, we had a surge as far as uh, influenza was concerned. And this was happening in the past also, as far as uh, uh, flu, active, uh, flu uh, during uh, the year was concerned. However, if you go more minutely, then you realize that influenza seasonality varies between different geographical areas within India. So we, even in our own country, we behave in a different manner. Influenza surveillance data suggest that we tend to peak during July, September, as far as the uh, Northern part is concerned, Delhi, Lucknow, and even Pune, Nagpur, Calcutta, and Dibrugarh, which is basically coinciding with the monsoon months. There occurs a peak during October to November, which coincides with monsoon in Chennai and Bellore. And there is a peak during January to March, which coincides with the winter months in Srinagar. Srinagar actually tends to behave very much like the Northern Hemisphere. You know, important here to remember that some cities like Delhi, Lucknow, and Nagpur show two, week, two peaks, the monsoon and the winter peak, which I've just showed you in our data, which we had seen in 2005 and subsequently. So there is a variation in the peaks as far as uh, parts of India are concerned. But broadly speaking, we tend to see peaks during the monsoon months and during the winter months. This is not different because such a pattern has also been reported from other countries. And this is data from China, which shows again that in China, there is a temporal uh, uh, sort of uh, difference as far as influenza is concerned. And in different parts, it varies in northern China as compared to southernmost part of China in terms of the uh, peaks uh, that are seen. And that is very uh, variable depending on the latitude. So it's something that we need to keep in mind when we really look at how influenza behaves in different parts of the world. The, it has to be looked at, at at a micro level also. So like I said, this has implications for our vaccine strategy because you need to give your, you want to give a vaccine strategy to cover the peak. So the recommendation of an annual influenza vaccine timing uh, is actually in uh, according to the winter peak in temperate countries. Uh, so that's why in the Northern Hemisphere, it's recommended that the vaccine comes out somewhere in October. And in the Southern Hemisphere, it comes out in April. But in India, I think we need to have a different this thing. We need to look at a pre-monsoon vaccine, which may be useful, and the timing prop needs to be modified. And this is something that we have pushed for a long time. And this actually uh, allowed, uh, uh, or the government actually allowed India to have both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere vaccine in the country because of the data that was presented many, many years ago. So the vaccine uh, schedule could vary depending upon the, uh, the uh, place one, where one is. You could have, because you have a July, September monsoon peak, for example, in Delhi, vaccination could be, should be in April or May. Uh, an October, December monsoon peak, uh, for example, in Chennai or a December to April winter peak in Srinagar, and the vaccine here could be in September or October. So depending upon where you are in our country, your vaccination strategy may have to vary depending on how the 
uh, when uh, the peaks are, tend to occur. And that is an important thing to keep in mind. And that's very different from what we see in the uh, parts of the Northern and Southern hemisphere. It's also important to remember that this may not work when you have a pandemic. H1N1 did not have any seasonality and we are not seeing any seasonality even now with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And uh, during the H1N1 pandemic, influenza was observed throughout the year and there was no seasonality. It took some time and now H1N1 has got the seasonality and we see that it behaves like uh, the normal uh, seasonal flu. But during the pandemic time, data from uh, the flu net showed that there was really no seasonality. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. The other important thing is that there is a lot of feeling that in our country, the burden of disease as far as influenza is concerned is not very much. And there is that is also something that we need to keep in mind. And this is a paper published quite some time back in the Lancet. Uh, our own center was involved in this and we uh, contributed uh, uh, from our, uh, uh, our rural health center in Ballabgarh, which is in, Har in Haryana. And uh, what we saw was, and this is basically estimated influenza associated acute low respiratory infection deaths in India, which was based on a verbal autopsy uh, in uh, Ballabgarh. And this actually estimated that every year, almost 24,000 uh, children are dying, uh, uh, who are young, less than five years uh, because of uh, influenza or acute uh, low respiratory tract infection. This is something that we need to keep in mind. And this is something which led on to an analysis which suggested that 6.5% of all pediatrics uh, acute low respiratory infection deaths in India was associated with influenza in 2006 to 2008. And this led to a huge number as far as the crude at attributable deaths was concerned in the developing countries. So influenza does cause a significant degree of morbidity and mortality. This data was subsequently even looked at in terms of uh, how does it vary in developed in, uh, in industrialized countries as compared to the developing countries. And it is not very different. If you look at the younger age group, and this can be extrapolated to the elderly also, there is significant degree of, uh, uh, the, as far as the uh, acute low respiratory tract infection is concerned, or severe low respiratory tract infection is concerned, it is significant even in our own country. And I think this is very important to keep in mind, because sometimes we tend to think that flu is something very mild and may not be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. This is a subsequent data analysis which was done at that point in time by Tim Yuki, who was from CDC. And he uh, had looked at the data in, in East and Southeast Asia and evaluated, uh, calculated that almost 11 to 26 percent of outpatient febrile illness and 6 to 14 percent of hospitalized, hospitalized pneumonia were due to laboratory influenza cases. And he's felt that uh, the influenza burden in Southeast Asia was significant and expanding and maybe similar to Europe and North America. We also did a study, and this is, there's been now studies from even Patel Institute, which has looked at acute viral uh, respiratory viruses and acute exacerbation of COPD. And again, when we looked at it, we found that there was a significant number of uh, viral infections causing exacerbation and 50% of them were related to influenza uh, as far as the exacerbation was concerned. We subsequently also did a systemic review where again we felt that viral infection was associated with almost 50% uh, of the acute exacerbation of COPD. And this was more uh, reported in Europe because they were doing a lot of testing as far as viral infection was concerned. So to conclude, I think uh, in temperate countries of the Northern and Southern Hemisphere, influenza is observed predominantly in the winter months. However, in tropical and subtropical countries like India, there may be more than one annual peak and we would continue to have some degree of influenza activity throughout the year with peaks happening during the monsoon months and the winter months. And this has implications for the annual influenza vaccination and that is why this needs to come out more aggressively in our guidelines and in terms of awareness among general physicians and specialists. Also, it's important to remember that influenza is associated with significant disease in tropical and subtropical countries the morbidity and mortality may be as much as it is in the Western world. And again, that is why the influenza vaccination becomes important in this part of the world also, if we need to decrease our mortality and morbidity associated with influenza. So I'll stop here and I've just tried to give you an overview. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guderia, for that uh, beautiful and brilliant exposition of the difference of uh, epidemiology of influenza in India as compared to the global epidemiology. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, next, uh, we'll be talking about uh, uh, challenges with uh, influenza vaccination and uh, in, in pulmonology. And the talk would be delivered by Dr. Raja Dhar. Dr. Raja Dhar is known to the whole audience. He is a chair, he's a governing body member, a chair of the Education Initiative Committee of the, the Indian Chess Society. He has been trained in respiratory medicine in the UK. He is currently a director of uh, pulmonology and he has uh, set up his uh, as a first DNB course in Eastern India. He has been director of research in education national in the, in the NABI and he is a chair of the training and education institutes of the ICS. He is the director of Hermes. He actually uh, wears many, many hats and he has published uh, very, very widely published 86 articles in peer reviewed journals. And, and he is a constant presence in most of the seminars or the webinars that are conducted under the auspices of the Indian Chess Society as also of other uh, countries. So it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Rajadar and invite him to deliver the next talk of uh, vaccination challenges in pulmonology, influenza vaccination challenges in pulmonology. Dr. Rajadar, please. Thank you so much, Parvez. Thank you for that um, introduction. Absolute pleasure to be here um, representing the Indian Chess Society and partnering with Nina SM for this meeting. Heartiest congratulations to you, Parvez, for having come up with this idea. It's your brainchild, and we have just been a part of this endeavor. So um, if I can just share slides one second. Professor Guleria has made my task easy by speaking about certain aspects I also wanted to speak on. So that will make my task simpler. And hopefully it will also emphasize certain points, which I think are relevant for emphasis. So the topic that Dr. Call has given me today is to emphasize the challenges that we face in influenza vaccination. And I'll try and elaborate on some of these. But before that, let's set things in context. It's long been said that influenza vaccination is of limited value. The efficacy of the vaccine is not really up to speed. These are certain figures from the CDC, which tell you how important influenza vaccination is and how much of morbidity it saves in the US. The numbers elsewhere in the world would not be any different compared to what is there on the slide in front of you. So 2015, 2016, so we are quoting numbers from five years ago. You saw in Dr. Guleria's presentation that the numbers, if anything, have gone up in spite of there being COVID for the last two years. So 5 million people, illness prevented by flu vaccination, 2.5 million medical visits prevented by vaccination, and more than 70,000 flu hospitalizations prevented during the 2015-16 season. So aside from morbidity, even if you think about the economic benefit that a country gains by organizing an adult vaccination program, influenza vaccination program, the benefits are enormous. A very quick look at the types of influenza vaccine. There's the egg-based vaccine, which is from chicken egg. Most of the vaccines that have been developed till date are egg-based. Viruses grown in chicken egg and injected into the egg, which replicate over a period of weeks till you get the inactivated and purified antigen. Then there's the cell-based vaccine, which are also viruses grown in eggs, but are mixed with mammalian cells. And then the ones which are grown without having the chicken host, the egg host, which is the recombinant flu vaccine, the flu block vaccine, which are on virus particulate matter. These are the newer vaccines, which are still under development. So those are the three broad categories of vaccine that we are looking at. Let's look at the influenza vaccination protocol, the guidelines which are given to us from ASIP. So the recommendation is that annual vaccination should be administered to every individual greater than six months for the influenza season. So the recommendation for vaccination is these groups of people, those aged between six months to five years, 
all aged more than 50. And then you have the long list looking at individuals with comorbidities, individuals with immunosuppression, people living in long care facilities, and certain racial groups throughout the world. So that's the entire list. I'm not reading through the list. This is something that would be present even in the local guidelines of individual countries that there are. And there is a lot of commonality between the national guidelines and what's recommended by ASIP. The Indian guidelines have been many, and these are adult vaccination guidelines over the years. One of the most recent guidelines, and I sort of underline that at the bottom for you, the Indian Chess Society guideline from 2020, which was drawn up in the presence of people who are in this meeting today. So in the presence of Dr. Parvez Kaul, Dr. Randeep Guleria, Dr. Rajesh Swarnakar, Dr. DJ Christopher, and uh, doctors from other specialties who came together and drew up the Indian Chess Society guidelines, which are, like I said, are not very different to what the ASIP guidelines have shown us. So these are the physician bodies and the societies have only put forward a few of the guidelines which have been published over the recent years. Let's look at the challenges phase because that's the main topic that I'm supposed to be discussing today. So I would argue that the most, the biggest challenge there is, is the mismatch between the need for vaccination in the individuals that I described a little while ago, the one who are enlisted in the ASIP guidance or in the other guidelines that I mentioned a little while ago and the acceptance of the vaccine. So let's look at this in greater detail. Some of the slides that I'm going to show you are Dr. Parvez Call's work and I'm very, very, um, I would like to acknowledge and thank him for providing me some of the slides of his work looking at this particular area. So this is looking at influenza and pneumococcal vaccination in people with diabetes. And I want you to look at certain areas. So you can see that the number of people who are vaccinated for influenza and pneumococcus in total. So this is the diabetes population, what you would deem as being the high risk population for getting influenza infections, for getting pneumo pneumococcal pneumonia. And you can see the number is less than 10%. So both the numbers at around 10% want you to look at, before you look at the next red blocks, I want you to look at the above 65 category. And even there, so you've got two risk factors above the age of 65 and the fact that they're diabetic. And you still have a measly less than 10% as the number of people who end up getting influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. Look at the paradox though. Answer to the question, has the doctor told you that there is a requirement for vaccination and you can see almost 100% of people seem to say that the doctor has indeed mentioned that there is a need for influenza and pneumococcal vaccination. And in the last box at the bottom, do you know of a requirement for the vaccination? And again, the answer in most cases is yes, I know there's a requirement for vaccination. And there's a gap somewhere, a gap in understanding, the gap in us conveying the message strongly enough to the people who merit the vaccine, even though people understand and know that they need a vaccine, they do not end up getting the vaccine. Is this something which is peculiar to diabetics? You know, India is the diabetic capital of the world. Is this peculiar to diabetics? Apparently not. So another paper from Dr. Call's group, which looks at the uptake of influenza vaccine in pregnancy in the Northern part of India. And you can see a large majority of the pregnant women have not been vaccinated. What about cardiac conditions? So cardiac comorbidity is another big area. And again, looking at groups of patients in Northern India with heart failure, you can see very, very few people with heart failure, which would be a major comorbidity in this group, hasn't been vaccinated with the influenza vaccine. So is it something that's with the lay patient or is it something that is also a problem, a bane with the healthcare workers. So strong recommendation, whichever group, not just from ASIP, it says ASIP here, not just from ASIP. If you look at the Indian Chess Society guidelines, if you look at the Association of Physicians of India guidelines, across the board, all healthcare professionals have been recommended very strongly 
to get vaccinated annually against influenza. And all facilities have been told to encourage their staff to get the vaccine. Most healthcare areas would actually provide the vaccine for their staff. So let's see what that translates into in a very developed country in the UK. So the National Health Service is famed for doing things right. So let's see what they did about five years ago in the winter season from 2014 to 2015. So I want you to look at numbers here at the top. All doctors, the total number vaccinated is just above 50%. So 54% of people getting vaccinated, 46%, which would mean do not get vaccinated. And if you look at various categories, so GPs, qualified staff, qualified nurses, other professionals, etc., the number of people is actually similar. So somewhere between 40% to 60% of individuals are unvaccinated and a similar number is vaccinated, depending on which category of people you're looking at. So even in a health facility, in a healthcare system, where the government provides the vaccines on a regular basis, we do not manage to get healthcare workers to get the vaccine. So the question that needs to be asked is, why is there a lack of understanding, even amongst healthcare staff, in a simple interventional measure like vaccine administration? Where lies the gap? So this was a study, again, from Dr. Call's group, which talked about knowledge, attitude, and practices about seasonal influenza vaccination among healthcare workers in Srinagar. And again, I would like to argue that what's true in Srinagar in India would be true, true for anywhere else in the country. So is an influenza potentially severe disease? And you can see that more than 84%, so 85% of people agreed that influenza is a potentially severe disease. The second question asked is, do you know of a vaccine against influenza? And here the numbers come down, but still about 60% of people would say that yes, they know there is a vaccine against influenza. Then comes the crunch, the, the very strong take home message. Have you ever received influenza vaccine? And you can see the not vaccinated population is about 95%. 95% of people in Srinagar, healthcare workers in Srinagar have not been vaccinated. So look at these numbers. I think they carry a strong message. Most people understand that influenza is a potentially severe disease. A large majority know that there is a vaccine against influenza. But it, when it comes to administration of the vaccine, most people, a very large majority, 95% or more than that, have never received the influenza vaccine. Is it a question of safety? Apparently not. So when they got asked, do they consider influenza to be a safe vaccine? 90, well, uh, most of the people said that they considered influenza to be a safe vaccine. So why is it that people do not want to take the vaccine? These are, the question asked was, if you've received the vaccine zero times in the past five years, please indicate the most important reasons for not participating. Here about 35%, a third of people said, I do not know about the uh, influenza vaccine. And then you can see the answers. Look at the top one. That probably would make us hang our heads in shame. I do not believe that the flu shot is effective. And then there is no time to get the vaccine at work. All lame excuses. The reasons members considered the influenza vaccine is unsafe. So that's a small number, a total of 83 people who felt that the vaccine is unsafe. And you can see the answers again in that small minority. Physician told me that the vaccination is unsafe. An internet site indicated that the vaccine should not be taken. It can weaken the immune system. It damages the immune system and so on and so forth. So I want to highlight two different points that Dr. Call and the group's study has come out with. The first is that there is a distinct lack of absorption of information that's been given out. People, in spite of being told, do not want to believe in the vaccine, do not feel that they have enough time to take a vaccine shot, which effectively should take no more than five minutes at the most. And then when you look at unsafe practices, maybe 
it's the communication of the people who understand the conviction of people being who understand being transferred to other healthcare workers or even to lay public in assuring them that the vaccine is safe and not only is it safe it's effective and something that needs to be taken on an annual basis this is the lovely study which looks at what happens if the vaccine is given free so free vaccine availability as a part of an employee health program is desired by participants so if it is given free would the patients take the vaccine an interesting answer most people would not even take the vaccine or all the people in the study would not take the vaccine even if this vaccine was provided free to people so again it's not a question of affordability it's not that the vaccine is costly it's just a communication gap a barrier which programs like this hopefully will assure the healthcare professional and that confidence can be transferred onto other healthcare workers and the lay public in ensuring that the vaccine gets given and the vaccine gets taken this was another study which looks at looked at knowledge attitude and behavioral responses of corporate employees and i won't lumber the same point again but you can see that the knowledge about the vaccine the attitude towards the vaccine and the practice of administering the vaccine all of this needs to be improved they need to be escalated and elevated to a certain level before the assurance comes that the vaccine needs to be taken so that was one question i think the biggest challenge that pulmonologists doctors physicians in this country and elsewhere throughout the globe face as far as administration of the influenza vaccine is concerned the second thing which dr guleria spoke about briefly and i will also touch on it briefly some of the slides will actually be repetitions is looking at influenza b so when we talk about influenza we mostly talk about influenza a we talk less about influenza b influenza b however is a considerable public health burden especially among children and at risk subjects they lead to seasonal flu pandemics and this happens every 2 to 2 and 1/2 years and about 20 to 30% of influenza cases every year is due to influenza b so a survey which is now a dated survey showed in a large number of specimens that about 25% were b viruses and the overall mortality associated with influenza b was greater as compared to what it was for h1n1 hence even though we speak about h1n1 much more this considerable mortality associated with this why am i mentioning this because this is something that needs focus that needs attention when we think about vaccine administration during the influenza breakout so the influenza b strain appears to be a major cause of seasonal flu epidemics causing absenteeism hospitalization and death and this is the crunch this is why i'm talking about this during a vaccination talk the fact that poor prediction of the b strain can lead to reduced efficacy of the trivalent vaccine which is what we used to use till about 2 years ago for most patients in this country so for vaccine efficacy we need to consider both the b strain and if the vaccines are well matched the vaccine efficacy may go up from the 60% that we quote today to above 80% so that's how important it is to look at vaccine efficacy and take the b strains into account what are the epidemiological virological characteristics of influenza b so this is a study which came from 26 countries southern northern hemisphere and the intertropical belt and dr guleria spoke about this during his talk the proportion of cases due to type and its lineages were looked at correlation between proportions of influenza b and the maximum weekly influenza like illness rates were looked at in the same season and the frequency of viruses virus mismatches were looked at and this is the distribution of the study in the northern hemisphere in the southern hemisphere and in the intertropical belt and like we talked about in the cohort which ended in 1999 you can see even in this cohort influenza b was about 22.6% and we found that the vaccine mismatch in this study was significant and it was mainly due to the influenza b strain 
So the influenza B, it was concluded, was a common disease with some epidemiological differences from influenza A, and this should be considered when optimizing control or prevention strategies in different areas and reducing the global burden of the disease due to influenza. This is looking at a literature review of epi uh, an epidemiology of influenza B in countries in the Asia Pacific region. And you can see the countries in the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere, which are outlined. And again, there's an emphasis on recognition of influenza B in trying to ensure vaccine efficacy. This is the third challenge I would argue for the pulmonologist, which is something that Dr. Guleria talked about in some detail about trivalent versus quadrivalent. And I will present the gist just for the sake of repetition. The fact that trivalent influenza vaccines would be most effective when the antigens in the vaccine match those of the circulating strain and the inclusion of quadrivalent influenza vaccine in influenza immunization programs have demonstrated health benefits. Hence, in our guidance from the Indian Chess Society, we have recommended the use of the quadrivalent influenza vaccine wherever there is availability and wherever financial challenges is not something that would be looked at. So that's something which is important. And these are recent meta-analysis which supported the quadrivalent vaccine uh, delivery in individuals, in children and adolescents aged 9 to 17 years and adults aged 80 to 60 years and elderly. The quadrivalent inactivated influenza vaccine was found to be more immunogenic as compared to the trivalent vaccine. The vaccination timing again is something that Dr. Guleria spoke about in detail. The fact that India is one of the only countries where both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere vaccines have been advocated in various parts of the country. The timing for administration of the influenza vaccine seems to be different. However, the pre-monsoon period seems to be the most important period for administration of vaccines. One of the things that we discussed as a group during the formulation of the Indian Chess Society guidelines on influenza vaccination was whether administering the influenza vaccine twice in a year would be something that can be looked at or not. This might give wider coverage in a very mobile population in this country, which travel between the cities that Dr. Guleria spoke about, where some of the cities, the recommendation is for a Northern hemisphere and some of the cities the recommendation is for a Southern Hemisphere vaccine. However, this is something which the future holds. We are still doing annual influenza vaccination and the area where you live in, in this country in India, is something that you have to consider when you administer the influenza vaccine. So this is sort of um, trying to propagate the same point, the tale of two cities in India, Srinagar, the case for the Northern Hemisphere vaccine, and Delhi, a case for the Southern Hemisphere vaccine, and this is true for the various parts of India. Won't labor this point anymore, but go on to talk about the divergent seasonal patterns of the influenza types A and B across latitude gradients in tropical Asia. So you can see that influenza A circulation is between November and March during winters in areas which lie 30 degree north latitude during monsoon months of June to November in areas between 10 and 30 degree north latitude. And influenza B circulation coincides with influenza A circulation in areas lying above 30 degree north. However, in areas south of 30 degree north, influenza B circulated year round at three to 8% of influenza B positives during most months with less pronounced peaks during the post-monsoon months. And this is from the Indian Chess Society guidance, and this is a map which is quoted often, which looks at the timing for influenza vaccination in various parts of the country. What about effectivity? I touched on this where I started off. Vaccine efficacy is something that we have spoken about in the course of this talk. So this looked at influenza epidemiology and influenza vaccine effectiveness during the 2015 and 16 season. And this is from the Global Influenza Hospital Surveillance Network. So this looks at 
the vaccine efficacy against influenza related hospitalization quoted at 16.3% lowering of hospitalization and among patients targeted for influenza vaccination against hospitalization for influenza a ballpark overall of 23 to 25% is what has been quoted so influenza vaccine effectiveness has generally been quoted at about 60% Effectiveness varied according to the influenza strain and age group. And if you manage to match vaccines, especially for influenza B, the effectiveness of the influenza vaccine can go up to as much as 80%. The other area that I'll touch upon before I finish off is influenza vaccine effectiveness amongst Hajj pilgrims. There's a lot of congregations. The data that we have is about Hajj pilgrims, but there are similar religious congregations with various religious sects in India. And to administer the influenza vaccine to these group of individuals is something that's a challenge in India and is so globally where such religious congregations happen. However, to administer the vaccine to these pilgrim areas, to these religious congregations is something which is of great effectivity. This is Dr. Call's paper, which looks at influenza vaccination in India and challenges for universal adoption. These are things that we have spoken about today. The fact that there's inadequate and patchy surveillance, there's a disconnect between perception and practice. And that's, I think, the most important factor that I have tried to highlight today. The fact that the message is going out, but is not going out in a fashion which would encourage people to take the vaccine on a regular basis. Physician societies and bodies do not universally recommend vaccination, even though this is changing. I showed you various guidelines in India, which are singing from the same hymn tune as we speak today. The universal vaccination programs should recommend influenza vaccination, but that's not happened as yet. Cost is not a major impediment, as I showed you, but is a factor that needs to be considered. And influenza vaccination has to be timed differently for different parts of the country, which is again, something that we need to think of. So I'll finish off there. And I would thank you for listening and we'll come back later on and discuss certain other aspects in the panel discussion. Thank you, Raja, for that uh, extensive uh, discussion of the challenges that the free uh, faces while uh, administering influenza vaccine. Uh, next, I would uh, quickly go on to invite uh, Dr. Sela, who gave the introduction initially, the welcome matrix, and he's going to talk about influenza and another important comorbidity that is in diabetes mellitus. And we are in the diabetic capital of the world. So Dr. Sela is going to talk about influenza and diabetes. Sela, please. Okay, uh, uh, again, uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pleased to listen to the colleague, Professor Guleria and the Dr. Ra uh, Raja. I think both presentation were really uh, superb in terms of providing the insightful of uh, uh, influenza in India and global as well. And I believe with all these knowledge and, 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 and in-depth knowledge of what's going on, we are uh, associations and the healthcare workers, we should do our best in, in order to facilitate the uptake of influenza, because this is a disease that has been underestimated uh, by, by many people, uh, particularly among the healthcare workers. So my first slide is just to uh, share with you the, the membership of our association. We would really invite everybody uh, to join the association. We have a lot of to share and a lot of to contribute in our community in uh, sharing uh, ideas and sharing experiences among different countries and different regions. So I really appreciate. So this is a site where you could be a member free of charge and without any, any penny to, to pay. 
Well, uh, again, uh, uh, just to introduce for those who are really uh, uh, haven't heard me earlier, my name is Salah al I'm a, a pediatrician. I'm a senior consultant epidemiologist and communicable disease advisor in the Minister of Health, uh, Oman, as well as uh, a chairperson for MENACEN's association. Well, uh, there's no doubt. I think today we have heard a lot uh, 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 around uh, influenza from uh, eminent speakers, uh, Professor uh, Randeep and, and, and Roger. And based on the latest report, uh, we have seen that the alarming rising burden of some of the diseases like diabetes, uh, both globally and regionally. And this disease has been considered to be one of the major public health challenges facing many countries. And uh, on the other side, sorry, oh, this is flying very quickly. Uh, on the other side, uh, we also see influenza as one of the major public health uh, uh, problem globally and has been identified uh, as one of the 10 priority of the communicable disease globally. So in these lines, my talk will be focused on diabetes and influenza to as much as possible to exclude influenza from diabetes complications. Because we have seen and the study have seen a lot that the people who are suffering from diabetes are really suffering a lot from influenza complications. Oops. So as I'm going through my talk, what I'll be doing, I'll be starting a bit of uh, giving you a key facts on diabetes mellitus, particularly in India, and as well as uh, influenza. I, I know that the previous uh, colleague have uh, uh, spoke around it, but just very quickly. And then we'll, I'll drive you through why diabetes uh, individuals are inclined to complication of influenza and then impact of influenza on diabetics patients. In addition to that, I will share with you as much as possible the benefit of influenza vaccination uh, for people suffering from diabetes, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, which, which is, there's no way we could discuss anything without rooming around uh, uh, a COVID-19. Well, uh, as already informed you, when we look at the prevalence of diabetes globally, we see this disease is a major global uh, uh, health, public health problem, and is considered to be one of the global emergency at the same time. And the map has really showed us, and the WHO has really showed us that this disease will be the seventh leading cause of mortality by 2030 if it hasn't been looked after and tackled the way that it should be. And we also see in this map some of the key, uh, uh, pre the trend of the diseases in our regions as, as a whole. And if you look at the South Asia, and if the disease hasn't been tackled the way that should be, the disease will be jump increase or increase up to 74% by 2045. And that's really huge. And, and I'm sure other uh, regions uh, like Africa will jump much higher uh, percentages. But again, South e Southeast Asia is one of the highest uh, uh, region that really having uh, and will have a higher pr uh, prevalence of diabetes if it is not been tackled the way that it should be at earlier stages. We also see India, this is a slide that show, and which is, I believe, uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Cole said, I, I've, I've taken a like the way that he described it, Indian bitter truth. We see that the diabetes been almost doubling over years, over every 10 years. 
and the prevalence now we are around 9.6 and if it is not been tackled we could reach as high as 10.8 per percent over the years so it is really a huge burden not only on health uh, system but economically at the country level it's going to be uh, cause a lot going back to influenza a bit of key facts that you have already heard it i'm going to go through them very quickly and uh, the the who estimated the uh, the uh, influenza to result in about three to five million cases of severe illnesses, uh, uh, which is give us around 290 to 600 respiratory deaths. And the global annual uh, attack rate estimated to be five to 10 among adults and 20 to 30 among children. And this is very much tally to what is going on as I think uh, Raja has already say that the burden of respiratory disease, particularly influenza, very high. So this is again, give us a lot of hint of what we, we are suffering in our countries among different uh, uh, gender and children as well. And um, the annual influenza epidemic results uh, of high level of hospitalization, and as well as we've been flooded with critical care admissions in, in our hospital due to the to, to the to the disease that could be easily uh, uh, over uh, overcome by vaccination. Uh, again, uh, I just to complement was uh, uh, by by presentation given by Dr. Raja. In addition to the disease burden that been given by prim, um, uh, eminent speakers, the cost for their hospitalization in India is so substantial. So it's not only we see the burden and, and mortality, but the cost of hospitalization so huge as being well addressed by uh, Dr. Cole and his colleague in, 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 in this uh, paper. And again, this is another paper that has been shown, but again by Dr. Call, the surveillance challenges that is facing India, uh, which is a, a number of those. And this is again, uh, it seems to be, it hasn't been put it in a way that in, in, in order to, uh, to uh, overcome some of these and really gonna help the country to uh, increase uptake at the level of uh, with the lowest level of uh, uh, healthcare workers. So let us go back to our question. Our question is why uh, uh, diabetes individuals are more susceptible or the influenza disease is why is more dangerous for people who are really suffering from uh, diabetes and why they get more complication of uh, uh, influenza compared to other to other individuals and usually as 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 the previous speakers already informed when we look at the influenza unfortunately we look at this part of the tip of the iceberg we just think this is a, a mild illness and hardly just we have this, but we keep forget, for, forgetting about all the, the reality of complication that really happening among different uh, 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 comorbidities and, and so forth among different groups like diabetes and, and, and others as well. And it hasn't been appreciated very well because when, unless uh, we have the disease burden in, in our hand and at the same time we look at and have very efficient system of these uh, death certificates to know exactly what the, what the cause of deaths of these uh, cases. Otherwise, usually most of these influenza deaths among the diabetes or the among all the comorbidities, they are just being under other being hidden under the secondary the other diseases like bacteria co-infection pneumonia and so forth so we don't see very much people describing these the the, the bottom of the iceberg as as in general well uh 
in general, why people, again, uh, people with diabetes are more susceptible to influenza complication. This is mainly uh, directly due to a number of facts that we know these individuals who are suffering from hyperglycemia. And uh, uh, there, there is a direct effect of these hyperglycemia on the immune system. And this is always, this is behind the, the increased susceptible of these individuals to all these complications. Nevertheless, humor, uh, humoral immune responses to vaccine is largely intact, and this is quite important for the vaccine. So without going into detail, the hyperglycemia of these individuals are really cause a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, dysfunction of uh, immunity uh, uh, among these individuals. And uh, if you go a bit in detail of immunogenicity of infectious disease in these uh, individual, uh, the, the published study have clearly shown that influenza may jeopardize the health of this individual by several ways. One of the one of these key mechanisms, the potential for inf infection has been shown that the higher incidence of infection is due to the uh, uh, promote immune dysfunction, poor uh, uh, immune response, uh, response, like micro and macro angiopathy, neuropathy, these immune dysfunction decrease in the antibacterial activities of urine, gastrointestinal and urinary dysmolity and more medical other interventions. So the environment of uh, hyperglycemia in this individual uh, may really have a, a direct effect of how these body uh, uh, affect or, or disaffect, you know, and, and, and react towards the the, the influenza and ultimately they get the, the infection, but because of these, they get more severe form of the disease and ultimately uh, cause, uh, causes uh, an, uh, uh, a co complication around it. Well, a, a number of the studies have been shown that uh, the people who are having diabetes experience more serious outcome following influenza, I've already said. In this study, showed that diabetes is associated with around two to three times increase the risk of influenza. And this individual also has been associated uh, the disease itself with increased number of hospitalization admission during the seasonal influenza around three to six times more risk compared to those who are not suffering from the disease and four times of risk of ICU admission following hospitalization, and finally four times risk of deaths from pneumonia and six times more risk of deaths. So all these, some of the uh, complication that is more taking place among diabetes that's suffering from uh, uh, influenza. Uh, in addition to that, this is another study also uh, showed that in UK, the prevalence of diabetes was higher among influenza cases than in March control, giving uh, around 1.1 odds ratio, and uh, at much higher risk, around six-fold risk of complication, and around three to six times higher risk in and getting all these hospitalization, and around. 31 to 92 times higher in deaths in, in influenza. This is another study uh, uh, from a uh, uh, Norwegian population show people with type two diabetes had twice the risk of hospitalization with influenza during H1N1 pandemic compared to those who without diabetes. And this is a, a, another, uh, a, experience uh, from uh, Hong Kong showed excess hospitalization associated with influenza among diabetes, uh, among a higher age group above 70 years. So going, uh, going to the, uh, uh, the next step by which I will uh, going through what are the evidences that we have uh, uh, in terms of interventions. And definitely the intervention very clear is 
uh, is vaccination. However, we do have an ample evidence that the, uh, the influenza do harm people with diabetes. Uh, so let us look at these uh, uh, intervention that we have so far. Uh, the, the vaccination, influenza vaccination, definitely has uh, uh, effect on reducing a numerous complication results uh, uh, by, a, by influenza among diabetes. And this study has indicated that in a nested case control study, influenza vaccination was associated with around in reducing 56% of complication and 54 in hospitalization and almost 58% in, in, in the deaths among that uh, group during a winter season. And uh, also this is another study that had been shown influenza vaccination has also uh, associated with reduced hospitalization rate up to among uh, diabetes and uh, 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 has been around 22% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and 30% hospital reduction in hospitalization for stroke and 19% hospitalization for acute MI. So we could see the, the impact of vaccination uh, among uh, the people who are really suffering from diabetes. This is another meta-analysis study show that among this group, Walking uh, of walking age influenza vaccination prevented of all causes of hospitalization by having vaccine efficacy of 58. So with the 58 vaccine efficacy of influenza can reduce a lot of uh, hospitalization. And with the vaccine of 43%, even though also could reduce uh, hospitalization due to influenza or pneumonia as, as a whole. Oh, so quickly, let's go to immunogenicity and safety among diabetes. Uh, and this study had been shown that when they measure the hemagglutination inhibition assay among healthy elderly adults and elderly adults with type 2 diabetes and show no significant differences in responses to non diabetes. So it seems to be they have very intact humor. Uh, responses to, to the vaccines. There's no problem in responding very well to the vaccine. And this is another study quickly showing that the zero protection rates in person with or without diabetes were not significantly different and are able to mount a normal antibody response to influenza vaccine, which may protect them from influenza infection with no doubt. And the adverse event for immunization of both type 1, type 2 have been shown uh, quite mild and very uh, uh, mild in terms of uh, uh, how highly we could see local reaction like pain, redness, and swelling. Uh, and hardly we could see uh, a systemic reaction that we, we, we know about. So the, the the, the adverse event very tolerable among diabetes patients. Well, we again, as I've already said from the beginning, there's no way that we could discuss about influenza without talking about the, the COVID-19. So now in light of these triple burden in our countries, diabetes, COVID and influenza, uh, when we add them together, we, we could really have a very serious problem among this individual. Why I'm saying so? Because when we look at uh, influenza uh, viruses, and here we have COVID viruses, but when you look at individuals who are really being affected by both these two diseases are the same, and diabetes are one of the diseases uh, 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 in fact, uh, uh, been uh, affected by both diseases. So if we have the diseases that, uh, the condition that could be very well, uh, very well impacted by both of the diseases, it's going to be really, so we need to take care of these individuals because they could really suffering from both complication. And as you have already seen, uh, for the last two seasons globally, 
the, the influenza uh, activities has been really crush course in 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 in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the seasonality and this is definitely due to the uh, a number of the reason behind uh, by, by implementation of all these uh, 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 non pharmaceutical uh, uh, non pharmaceutical intervention has really led a lot in reducing the activity of influenza globally uh, but when you look at the the the, the countries now we, we see that the restrictions and all of that has been really lax and and people are not really follow and this is what uh, most of, of scientists agree the influenza if not been tackled the way it looked into the way that it should be, will eventually rebound and possibly be more fiercely than before because the individual are losing their immunity. So with this sort of gap, two years gap of no a huge burden of the diseases, and if this is going to take place now, we the country really going to face a, a huge burden of disease i could i could say in my own countries we are really facing now a much higher and much more severe form of influenza compared to the previous uh, times that we had it in, in in the last two years so the who came up with a very strong recommendation to uh, uh, to push the country towards vaccine all the eligible individual that came up in in 2020 and 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 uh, again reemphasize again in 2000 in October 2020 that encourage all the country to use the tool as much as possible to vaccinate all the highest priority group and of course uh, this group that you have heard a while ago from Dr. Raja, um, I just want to focus on diabetes. And one more thing that came up as a recommendation lately from WHO, uh, if you remember at earlier stages of uh, COVID-19 vaccination, the recommendation was giving the COVID and then give it a 14 days and, and then uh, give a, a, the shot of uh, influenza. But with the current uh, recommendation, both vaccine could be given simultaneously during the same vi visit. There's no harm in that. Well, again, the issue of vaccination coverage is a quite huge and, and hardly you could see countries with all the, even the country with a very good policy have re, will be, are re, reaching the, the target that WHO recommended, which is 75 and above for the, for the vaccine. Hardly you could see, and even my own country with the free vac, uh, influenza vaccines, uh, hardly we could see up to hardly 40% of coverage among diabetes. And, uh, for me, I, I'm, 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 uh, I won't go into this because this is, has been very well addressed by Dr. Raju. What I want to see in this slide, has, this is a study that has been done by Dr. Cole and his colleague to see the hesitancy. Uh, uh, just 4.4 being vaccinated among uh, healthcare workers. This is showed there's a lot of hesitancy among this group. And I think Dr. Rajan has clearly addressed uh, through the, this uh, uh, paper what the sort of hesitancy. So you, the hesitancy had been very well addressed in, 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 in India to, to, to tackle the issue. So to address, to improve the influenza vaccine among patients with diabetics. First of all, I think this is exactly what we have heard from Dr. Raja that a number of these uh, 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 studies that have been done around uh, knowledge, attitude, and behavior among healthcare workers. So we know where are the problems. So usually problems may fall into these four compartments. And, and I personally believe uh, uh, this is the last comp uh, compartment, which is strong physician endorsement because these are the individual who are really the key driver for, vaccine, for influenza vaccination in our country. So uh, if we tackle very well this component, we may be easily uh, able to uh, having a higher coverage rate. So, but again, we need to improve the access. We need to have a very 
focused, strategic way of tackling awareness uh, uh, around influenza based on the CAP surveys. Uh, this is my uh, last uh, final slide. This is our Mina SN uh, uh, paper that has been published recently to push the countries like uh, countries from Gulf Cooperation Council in addressing the issue of diabetes during and, 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 and influenza during COVID-19 to address it in a way that to push the, the healthcare worker to understand the importance of uh, looking after these individuals who are really suffering from diabetes. So by this, I would say there's no doubt that influenza is more frequent and more severe among patients with diabetes and could lead to uh, a serious health complication, both hospitalization and deaths, which is underestimated very much in our countries. The immunogenicity and safety of influenza vaccine in these individual appear to be comparable to non-diabetes. So we don't have to worry about that. And we as a healthcare workers, we need to uh, look, try to see the means and ways to promote and strengthen the advice to these in the patients annually for the countries like India, where you have to have both uh, uh, seasons to advise them to, to, to be vaccinated and to reduce as much as possible to increase the alertness among the community, which is we have to do it, but don't forget healthcare work. I think by this, I'm reminding you again, we are looking forward to uh, uh, invite you for uh, uh, to be a member in our association as much as possible. Thank you so much for your attention and looking forward for uh, have this sort of collaboration very soon again. It was really amazing. Thank you so much. Over, Dr. Cole. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you uh, so much for that extensive discussion on influenza and uh, diabetes and. Uh, I think now we quickly move on to the panel discussion, which is the final component of our today's program. And uh, we have an eminent uh, panel of uh, uh, panelists and uh, representing both the associations from uh, MENA and We have Dr. Uh, Mini Dorsu uh, Tenry over. Sorry, MENA, if I'm not able to pronounce it right. She is the secretary of the MENA ISN Association, is uh, a professor of internal medicine at the ASTP University of Faculty of Medicine and uh, is a board member of the has to be University Vaccine Institute. Uh, she's editor-in-chief of the EFM Academy, that's the European Federation of Internal Medicine. And uh, she is also a member of the Quality and Professional Issues and Adult Vaccination, that's the Advice Working Group of EFM. Uh, another representative from uh, the MENA ISM would be Dr. Fatima al Salin, who's so you're currently working with the WHO as a technical advisory member of experts on diabetes, the AGD group. She is director of diabetes prevention and control program. She works uh, in UAE and uh, she is in country director of King Abdullah Fellowship program of the Emory University. And uh, she also has is widely published. And uh, I uh, represent both the associations. Uh, I'm the vice chair for uh, for the MENA uh, Association and, and, and represent the governing board member of, of, the, of the ICS as well. Uh, we are also joined by Dr. Rajesh Swankar, who is the National Secretary of Indian Test Society, uh, practices in Nagpur, and uh, he is uh, the secretary and is a widely published person, is a member of many, many associations. And also, we are also joined by our immediate past president, Professor DJ Christopher, uh, who was an immediate past president of the Indian Society, is from Velour uh, in South India. He is uh, the chair of the research committee of the Indian Chess Society and is widely published and has been uh, included in the Stanford's uh, Stanford University's world top two percent scientists, and uh, he has more than two hundred publications. And uh, with this eminent panels, we uh, our panelists, we also have uh, the speakers. 
and uh, the session would be moderated by uh, Dr. Raja Dhar. I hand it over to Dr. Raja. I would also uh, request the, the uh, participants to type in their, their questions or comments in the chat box, which would be finally taken to the speakers. Dr. Raja, please. Thank you, Parvez. Thank you so much. Absolutely honored to be a, a moderating this uh, eminent panel. We don't have a lot of time, so we'll kick off. And um, one of the things that uh, stuck me with uh, Dr. Avedi's talk was his correlation about influenza in COVID times. And I, I'll start off with that, and I'll start off with you, Parvez, if that's okay. I wanted to ask you, what do you think is the relevance, generally speaking, of influenza today? We've seen COVID, we're seeing the third surge in India. I'm sure it's similar elsewhere in the globe. What do you think is the relevance of influenza today in a globe which is fast being taken over by COVID? So that's a very important question. And uh, Raja, uh, if we look at the, what happened to influenza and that has been pointed out, previously by speakers, especially by Randeep, that there has been a lull in the circulation of influenza as a result of the COVID pandemic, whatever it has been attributed to. And most likely it's been the COVID appropriate behavior that people were forced to take because of the circulation of wide circulation of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, however, as the as we have cruised along and we have got, kind of got uh, tired of this pandemic and uh, people have actually gone to a bit complacent with the COVID epidemic, appropriate behaviors. There has been a steady surge in the cases of uh, influenza, even though the COVID uh, stays in the backdrop. So uh, I think uh, now we are in a setting where there is a co-circulation of both the SARS-CoV-2 virus as well as the influenza uh, virus. And it's actually very important for ourselves to protect ourselves against at least one definite pathogen against we have a, a hugely effective vaccine. Uh, and uh, now that we have vaccination for COVID also, I think it's a very important responsibility of the healthcare community to convey to their patients that they should be protect they should protect themselves against both the viruses. Yeah, thanks Parve. So we have throughout India seen influenza especially in the lull between the second wave and the third wave. I just wanted to get a different viewpoint from somewhere else in the world. So Dr. Tanryover, your take, uh, have how much of influenza have you seen in the past few months or maybe a year? And um, is it similar to our experience in India? Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for your very kind invitation to this panel. Uh, so let me just share my experience from Turkey. I'm based in the capital city of Turkey. And actually, we don't have uh, different regions with different seasonality. So the seasonality is usually unique uh, among the country. So what we have experienced is um, absolutely zero other respiratory viruses in the uh, last influenza season. We have seen none. Uh, as I'm also actively involved in the uh, influenza surveillance uh, network, I can say that uh, very confidently. But this year, uh, starting from um, the summer season, we have started to see other respiratory viruses and especially the respiratory syncytial virus started to circulate uh, in the uh, summer months, starting June, July. Uh, but we haven't experienced influenza up until now. And the, um, normally the, um, in the epidemic influenza season starts around the second week of December in Turkey. And we see the first peak uh, during January and the second peak with the influenza B uh, mostly uh, around March. So uh, we have started to see the influenza cases uh, last week. So now we have a combination of uh, different patients uh, administered to the emergency care units, uh, infected with influenza A mostly. Uh, and also the other respiratory viruses are still uh, in the circulation like parainfluenza, other coronavirus types, adenoviruses. So it's uh, really becoming a challenge uh, to differentiate between the etiology of the patients who have uh, presented with COPD acute exacerbation or uh, lower respiratory tract infections. So uh, what uh, th this was our, uh, this was what we were afraid of actually last season, uh, the coincidence of the COVID-19 and influenza. And uh, starting from uh, this season ahead, I think we will uh, see the challenge a lot more uh, as the, uh, as the uh, healthcare system will uh, 
begin to face the challenges of uh, a huge population infected with influenza. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll come to you with a question on similar lines, uh, uh, Dr. Christopher. And, uh, you know, you guys have seen probably the most number of COVID cases or one of the institutes with the most number of COVID cases, at least in India. So how do you actually suspect other viruses, including influenza? Or is it just doing a panel where you sort of accidentally pick up influenza? What sort of makes it uh, ring uh, a bell to ring in your mind to say, might this be influenza rather than COVID when you see these cases in the last one and a half, two years? Uh, Raja, as uh, has been already alluded to, COVID kind of wiped out influenza and we hardly saw influenza. So differentiating them on the basis of their clinical presentation is extremely difficult, if not impossible. You know, the uh, sure. fever, body ache, throat symptoms, rhinorrhea, all these are common. So I don't think there's anything uh, specific to distinguish these conditions. Uh, now, we know that COVID is probably more contagious than, uh, than influenza. Uh, we know that COVID has probably has a more protracted period uh, of uh, transmission of infection from the host. Uh, and so these are the differences between the two. Now, two things. Now, uh, in the UK, the last week, I think every second person uh, with a flu-like illness was Omicron. So in fact, Omicron symptoms are much more like influenza perhaps than sure. uh, the predecessors. So we have a challenge at hand, especially with Omicron. And though I also recently read a report about the coexistence of influenza and COVID, the flonora, fluorona, as they called it in, this is a report from Israel. So, you know, it's a, it's a difficult time and it's a challenge to distinguish the two. We have to resort to testing if we really have to diagnose one or the other. So, DJ, just to sort of drive home that point, would we or should we recommend that we do a panel, something like a biofire panel, to look at influenza because that is something which is treatable? And if we are thinking of co infections, is that something which we should look at at least in big institutes throughout the country? Uh, Raja, it is possible to do that, but I'm just being more public health conscious. And at this point in time, the one thing that you want to diagnose is uh, COVID. Sure. So, you know, when these symptoms are there, you give COVID. And when there are, when you have a fear, you also treat uh, influenza. But sure. I think you, you, at this point in time, you probably test COVID for all these patients and then played by the year. Sure. sure. Um, I'll come to you, Dr. Swarnakar. Dr. Swarnakar, uh, to get you into the discussion, I spoke to an extent about the timing of the influenza vaccination in India and the fact that we've vaccines from two different hemispheres. Dr. Guleri alluded to it, and so did Dr. Avayadi. It's difficult. We've got a very mobile population. It's difficult to actually have different timings for the vaccine in different parts of the country. So I, so I wondered about your thought process for physicians, for clinicians who are on this platform or even those who are not. What do you think is the right time to vaccinate in India? How do you go about overcoming this conundrum of when to vaccinate people for influenza in India? Hello, everybody. So there is a straight answer to this question, as you all know, and you have elicited in your own lecture, that, that actually considering India's large also landmass and also what called varying of geography, and, and I would quote from our guidelines that we have done. We have got actually a variable influence of sustainability, and there is a need to actually develop actually what we call regional specific influenza vaccination. Of course, it will depending on the peak, peak there and also seasonality uh, that is there in that in that also particular region. And these are the regional protocols for individual states, uh, which actually should be based on also what what, what we call surveillance studies that will lead to greater emphasis on the best actually period of influenza vaccination administration so as has been discussed that we got two two peak two then peak of uh, peak peak then also what called seasons uh, 
which would be June and end of December. So I think we we actually need to have what kind of national surveillance, uh, which will actually tell us this answer. But as of now, I think we can just stick to the 70 percent of population would need it. I think between what June to November, and uh, I think 30 percent would need it uh, between what we call December and May. But right. and then of course we have we have then also what 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 was specific the cities wherever this can be done. So it needs I think national national so I mean also this same studies to do which of the region will have to do sure uh, which month. Thanks, Rajesh. I'll come to Dr. Fatima. Dr. Fatima, I've got a very interesting question in the question box, which I'll take to you. And maybe I'll take it the same question to Parvez after that. So there's a question from Dr. Haider Mansoor, who asks about a low and negligible circulation of influenza in the COVID times, like we have all discussed, and about how we think this would uh, translate into trying to predict a circulating strain in the 21-22 season. And will it be effective enough to prevent influenza infection? So I think that's a very valid question. And I wanted your thoughts and then Pervez's thoughts on this. Thank you for the question. Uh, one of the interesting things that we have learned in Saudi Arabia, that the influenza rates among our population that uh, really dropped down um, in the last two years. One of the good reason what's happening that people start, uh, one of the biggest issues that we're really facing that the lockdown that really helped people from transmission of the influenza from people to the other. And the other thing, the new hygiene things that people get through the COVID-19. So that are the most two things that really helped us on the dropping the rate of the influenza among our population. Um, also other things that uh, we have, um, our campaign for influenza vaccines start from end of October, it goes all the way to March every year. So, and this has really helped us, especially with having the telegrams that have coming to Saudi Arabia. This is really a, a good thing to work on the vaccination. So uh, this is how we think about it. Grand, um, uh, that's excellent. Pervez, anything that, uh, I hope uh, Dr. Call is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, Pervez, <laughs> anything that you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so I, mean, I think this is this is a very very pertinent question because uh, we know that the vaccine development is a process which takes place as a result of uh, global surveillance of uh, the uh, influenza viruses and more, many laboratory surveillance laboratories contributing to WHO's final recommendation of the of of the vaccine composition, and uh, these uh, uh, th these meetings take place somewhere in February and September and they give the uh, the, the guidance for the uh, the um, winter season as well as for the for the uh, for the summer season uh, in 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 the NH uh, in cases which is the winter for the southern hemisphere. So yes, uh, because we be collecting less, there is a distinct. Uh, possibility that the circulating strain might not actually match with the uh, vaccine strain because it's all depending on your predictable predictiveness or, or, of what you believe that would be circulating. So this possibility is certainly there. And as we are seeing more of a surge of influenza now, so this is something that we need to look at and see whether, uh, say, 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 three months down the line, we have had a good match or not. Sure. Thank you. And uh, another question quickly to you, Appa Parvez. Um, wanted to ask you about this interval between vaccination for COVID and for influenza. If you remember the initial guidance that we have from the government of India, there was supposed to be a finite few weeks before you administered the two vaccines. Is that something you practice? I heard Dr. Avedi talking about no gap required. Um, is that... What you so, would normally so, so so generally, I mean, if we talk of the guidance from the Ministry of Health, it stays. I mean, uh, the two week no. period period as of now it stays. However, if we to look at the ASIP guidelines, they say that if there is no requirement of this wait of two week period. You can straight away give two shots in two arms at the same site. So uh, that can be used. 
However, uh, the ASIP, we have to uh, keep in consideration that the consideration that the vaccines that we administer in, in India are very different from the ones that are approved for use in the US. So uh, we, we might as well stick to the guidelines uh, actually recommended by the Minister of Health because uh, both uh, the COVID shield and co-vaccine that we mostly use in India are not approved for usage in the US. Sure. So I think that's a message for the Indian audience, which is sort of listening in today that our government of India uh, guidelines still remains two to four weeks, even though, as Dr. Avedi pointed out, the ASIP guidelines say that they can be done simultaneously. I wanted to come to you, DJ, about a question which I know is close to your heart, um, about how to educate, how to uh, promote influenza vaccination, both in the healthcare worker and within the community at large. Uh, your top tips, how do you go about doing it? And what do you want to tell our audience today? Yeah. So, Raja, I, I was just looking up the some of the publications, and I came across Dr. Avedi's publication on the uh, healthcare worker perception of vaccination. So, I, I just want to. This is quite interesting, and I was impressed that 60% of the healthcare workers were vaccinated in 2018, 2019, and the highest uptake was among nurses. And self-protection and protection of community were the most cited reasons for vaccine acceptance, uh, with side effects being the main reason for hesitancy. So I have to tell you that uh, the uptake is much less among our healthcare workers, uh, substantially less. And that is uh, something to be not proud about. So if you ask me what are the ways to take this forward, I think the first and foremost thing is education. Even healthcare workers do not know the importance of influenza vaccination. As uh, was alluded to by Radeep Galeria, you know, influenza can kill. I don't think anybody thinks in, you know, when I say anybody, it is most people ever imagine that influenza could be a killer. So first and foremost is education. The second, I think, is to create facilities which healthcare workers can access without much difficulty. The staff student health service, the chest clinic, the you know the geriatric clinic, and so on and so forth. GP. And the third one is, I think, uh, while I think you showed data that uh, giving free vaccines didn't really uh, shoot up the uptake. I, for one, think that if you want to make a start, it should be free. Uh, to convince people that it's important and also to say you pay for it is uh, is a bit of a double uh, jeopardy. So I think we should uh, try and get uh, free vaccines. So I sure. think these are the points that I wanted to make. And just to add to that, maybe Dr. Haider Mansoor says possibility of universal flu shot. Uh, I think that's probably if it comes in the guidance of uh, various national societies, I guess that would also promote push people into taking it um, is something to add to. Let yeah. me come to you, Dr. Tanrio. We're at something very interesting. Um, Dr. Christopher alluded to this, but there's a question which I think is relevant in the, in the chat box, which talks about when would you empirically treat for influenza during the pandemic? So during the COVID pandemic, when do you think, okay, this patient might have influenza and give, let's give them the seltamivir, given it's a relatively harmless drug. Your take. Yeah. Thank you. So um, this is... Um actually something that we need to discuss because uh, it's impossible on clinical uh, basis to differentiate between COVID-19 and influenza in most of the patients. So if you do not have the uh, background to test each and every patient with the molecular tests to do a respiratory viral uh, panel, then you have to start Oseltamivir and Prickly. That's what we do uh, in our clinic. So because even though you have the respiratory panel molecular testing, the test results usually come up in two or three days and you have a very short period of uh, starting Oseltamivir, if you do not start it in the first uh, 48 to 72 hours, then it's nonsense. So you have a very limited time period to start Oseltamivir. And even though you have the testing capacity, it will take some time uh, and it will uh, just uh, make you late. So uh, if, especially in severe COVID-19 patients who are in ICU, who need mechanical ventilation and a sort of mechanical ventilation, who are hemodynamically unstable, 
seps in sepsis, for example, then there's no uh, need to wait or to uh, suspend oseltamivir. Uh, it's better to empirically start it. Uh, one uh, tricky side may be this. Uh, actually, the usual period of oseltamivir is five days. But when we have some patients uh, in which in whom we think that the uh, viral replication is ongoing, like immunosuppressed patients, like patients with cancer who uh, have uh, severe respiratory failure, then sometimes we may need to uh, uh, need to um, make the period longer, like uh, the, the treatment, like to 10 days, so that uh, even though we started empirically, then again, it's useful to have uh, the molecular testing results in hand in order to see, uh, to confirm that if the patient has influenza and if the clinical uh, response is not there, then we need to uh, prolong the duration of treatment with oseltamivir. But in the peak season with influenza, there's no way to differentiate on clinical grounds, so it's better to empirically start it in patients uh, with ILI. Thank you very much. That's very lucid. Thank you very much. Um, I see the second part of Dr. Mansoor's question is about once in a lifetime flu shot, I think that's going to be another lifetime before it comes with the shift in the phenomenon we see with influenza. So that's yes. uh, that's going to take a while, I think. Uh, let me come to you, Rajesh, and I know this is something you're passionate about. You've done a lot for. So role of national societies in promoting awareness for immunization among adults. And um, tell us your opinion. I know you've got a strong opinion about this. And how would we take this forward, not just as Indian Chess Society, but national societies throughout the world, throughout the globe. How would you chalk out a plan for us? Yeah, so you either yourself have talked about challenges actually facing this influenza vaccination in India. So what I feel it there has to be some, I think, mandate beyond just guidelines. And I think societies have role of advocacy with actually administration to also make it as what you call compulsory adult adults vaccine. And which is shooting just annually and uh, way to increase the awareness among just not only patients but also with doctors i know yourself have said that there is a gap it's also in what we call delivery of this vaccine and undertaking national surveillance or uh, having i think what we call a registry or sort by our uh, by uh, these and also uh, what we call organization to then also get the data and i think we also need to just present it to also policymakers. I think that will go, I think, a long way. And of course, partnering with the influencer network, like like now we have got MENA, ICN, that will also be, I think, what you call pivotal to achieve some of our common goals. And then we've got to increase the awareness among our also brethren by the also popularizing guidelines through, I think, conference and also CME webinar. And also to reach to also beneficiaries uh, through uh, the public forum and to also make them aware. I think that should be the role of, uh, I mean, ICS or just, I think, all these, uh, what they call organization and uh, other NGOs. That is oh. what I think we can just chip in to yeah. just to go, uh, I think, a long way in achieving our goals. Uh, about this influencer definition of awareness and also making it quite popular. Thank you so much, Rajesh. Very, very pertinent, relevant points. I think we have sort of run over uh, time by about 15 minutes. So maybe part in remarks and um, maybe um, one from each society. Let me uh, start off with you, Parvez. I know you wear both hats, but uh, let me ask you this question with the Indian Chess Society hat on. And, um, you know, we are at the verge of the third wave. We are all filling up our hospitals again. And um, we were hoping that we see light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe there is light of the, at the end of the tunnel, but a little further on as compared to what we saw. So influenza epidemics will keep coming, I guess, once COVID goes away. So any learnings that you feel that have been relevant in COVID, that we have learned from COVID, which we can apply to influenza epidemics or pandemics going forward, if and when they happen, or generally respiratory viral pandemics, learnings from COVID that you think will help us in the future to tackle such global pandemics? So that's a very pertinent question, Raja. And I think uh, the most important thing that actually we learned uh, during COVID times that 
when we resort to routine COVID appropriate behavior, be it using social distancing, be it using sanitize, hand sanitization, or using a university, using a mask, and actually preventing yourself getting into overcrowded settings. Those are the kinds of measures that have proved to be universally effective in preventing uh, development of any kind of a respiratory viral infection. I would take that as the most important learning from our uh, COVID times. And, and uh, if we mean to prevent influenza in subsequent seasons, when hopefully the COVID is gone, I think a routine uh, practice of these COVID appropriate behaviors would be the key uh, to, to fighting them off. Thank, thank you, Parvez. And a one line message from everyone. So I'll start off with uh, Dr. Tanri over and then talk to the rest. I think Dr. Fatma has been disconnected, but uh, from yes. the rest. So just a short comment uh, from each of you before we conclude this lovely session. Yeah. So uh, just uh, I would uh, like to um, uh, end up with uh, the main uh, take home message, prevent what can be prevented, because we should be aware that once a respiratory virus is uh, damaging the respiratory system, then the possibility of other respiratory viruses just uh, sit in the respiratory mucosa and increase the damage uh, becomes more and more uh, prevalent, more possible. So uh, we should keep in mind the, uh, the precious uh, effect and the uh, opportunity of the vaccines, not only influenza, but also the pneumococcal vaccine. And just, uh, just try to prevent everything that we can prevent in these COVID-19 times, because uh, we have the tools, uh, the influenza vaccine, the pneumococcal vaccine, and the COVID-19 vaccine, but we have many, many several viruses that we cannot prevent. So at least we should try to prevent what we can prevent. Sure. Thank you. So that's a strong message, Dr. Tanriyovar, and I think the consciousness about adult vaccination has never been greater as compared to what it is now with yeah. COVID vaccination, and we should drive home that point. So I'll come sure. to you, Rajesh, next for your message to the audience, and maybe, maybe Dr. Awedi, we can see you and have a message from you um, before we finish. So I, think, we can just... so I think that leveraging on importance of COVID vaccines that we have all now realized, I think we can just propagate our cause of a universal influenza vaccination in this in this part of the world. And I think we would need to emphasize on also the importance of preventive vaccination uh, now that we know the importance of COVID vaccines. I think that would be way forward and I think would be appropriate at this point of time. Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. Um, Dr. Christopher, and then I'll finish off with Dr. Avedi. Dr. Christopher, your message. Yeah. So, you know, we did not anticipate COVID. Uh, we expected a influenza pandemic sometime and maybe we will have it sometime uh, god forbid it comes but uh, you know we have to be wise so however we try to prevent we have we we, we still may not fully succeed in uh, completely averting a pandemic so my message is that pandemic preparedness should be like preparation for war it should be carefully planned and in place ready to be deployed at short notice I think that's the way forward. Thanks. Very, very strong and pertinent message. Uh, thank you, Dr. Christopher. Dr. Avedi, a one-line comment from you. I couldn't uh, help yeah, myself. Uh, I could see you, sir. No, no. Thank you so much. Again, I, I think uh, there is a strong... I think this is, has been said, but I'll, I, I think this is the right thing. There's a strong need to focus on all the adult vaccination because this is the, uh, the door that we could hit not only influenza, other vaccination as well. That's the only thing that I could say. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you very much. And uh, big thank you from my side. I really enjoyed doing that panel. Um, sharing of thoughts between two societies, erudite members of two societies is always enjoyable. I hope the audience enjoyed that conversation between us and gained something out of it. Thank you very much for coming in. And I'll hand over to our host, Dr. Parvez Call. To, for the final tab vote of thanks. Parvez, all yours. So, so thank you, Raja, for that uh, nice uh, moderation of the um, panel discussion. So the, for the vote of thanks, I would actually hand over to our secretary, uh, and Dr. Rajesh Swankar, and uh, I would also uh, certainly place a vote of thanks for uh, our technical channel partners, Clarinet who uh, did a wonderful job with today's uh, webinar. Uh, Dr. Swankar, for the final vote of thanks, please. On uh, behalf of uh, Indian Chess Society, foremost, uh, I should thank Dr. Parvez, who conceptualized 
this webinar and did liaisoning work with Middle East, Eurasia and Africa Influenza Stakeholders Network uh, being also its vice chair. We appreciate the benevolent presence of chair of this network, Dr. Salala Al Awadi, welcoming us and giving a lucid talk on important aspect of influenza. I also extend a very hearty vote of thanks to our panelists today. I hope I am not mispronouncing their name. Please pardon me. Dr. Mine Durusu Tanriyovar, Secretary, Mena ICN, and Dr. Fatima Al Salal, Member, Governing Council of the network. Thanks are due to our own Dr. Randeep Guleria, Director, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. Dr. D.J. Christopher, yes. our immediate past president of Indian Chess Society for sharing their insights, giving us their valuable time out of their very busy, uh, busy schedule. I also wish to express my gratitude to my friend and orator, moderator, par excellence, <laughs> Dr. Raja Adhar, as always, you have done a very excellent job, Raja. Finally, I would uh, like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks for near-perfect logistics support from our ICS back office staff, staff Sakshi, Monika, Vivek, and also to our digital streaming partner today, ClearNet. Thanks are due to our valuable audience who joined us today. So, thank you all once again. Namaskar, Shabba Khair, take care, stay safe, till we meet again. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.